My name is Jeff Jewell. I'm a professional civil engineer and I am owner of a company called Jewell Tidegates. This is a video about the present conditions at the Edison Slough Tidegates as of the summer of 2012. This is three and a half years after the knockoff of my Aberdeen Tidegate design was first retrofitted with my variable backflow flapgate or VBFG control mechanism. As of July 2012, my VBFG control mechanism at Edison Slough has been allowing backflow on every flood tide for three and a half years. Unlike the Waterman SRT that was originally installed here, the Tidegate with my VBFG mechanism allows a modest amount of backflow and then closes reliably and consistently during the flood tide when the rising water reaches a desired elevation. This is video showing water backflowing through the Tidegate during a flood tide. When the water downstream reaches elevation 5.7 above mean lower low water, the Tidegate will close. I use the predicted tides for Cherry Point to determine at what time the tide would reach elevation 5.7. I was off by 4 minutes. Not bad. Oh, there it goes, Jeff. 5.16. Four minutes early. Because of the alternating outflow and backflow at the tide gate, debris does not accumulate on the trash rack. In reality, the trash rack is not needed since any floating material that comes from upstream will easily pass through the open side hinge flap gate. I didn't capture it on film, but I've watched these ducklings happily pass back and forth through the trash rack and flap gate when the flap gate was open. They would never attempt this with the normal flap gate. The vegetation upstream from the tide gate has changed dramatically as a result of the daily brackish backflow. The brackish water within the channel has caused the native salt tolerant vegetation to thrive, and it has caused the undesirable invasive reed canary grass and Himalayan blackberries to die off within a 15 foot wide strip along the shore of the slough. See the vegetation's eight feet tall. It's all salt marsh vegetation. And if you get over this way, it's high enough to be away from the salt water. You have the infamous reed canary grass. It's downstream from the Edison Slough Tide Gate, uh, 100 yards, 200 yards. And here's they have they have full tidal influence, so you don't have the same high tide every day. Uh, some days the high tide be a foot or two higher than other days. And I think with the variation, it's um, not so conducive to the real lush vegetation like we have just upstream from the tide gate. If you look at this vegetation, it's a similar kind of plants, but they don't seem like they're quite as, as uh, vibrant and, and bursting with life. In 2006, the trouble plate Waterman self regulating Tide Gate, or SRT, was removed, and a knockoff of my Aberdeen Tide Gate, a GH850 produced by Golden Harvest, was installed at Edison Slough. A regular top hinge flap gate, also from Golden Harvest, their GH39, replaced the SRT that was on the culvert to the left in this photo. According to the person who lives just upstream from the Edison Slough tide gate, the GH850 just sat there, stuck shut, until January of 2009. In this photo, which was taken from Golden Harvest's online tide gate catalog, the tide is relatively low and is obviously ebbing, or falling. The GH850 should be open, but it is in fact closed. The tide gate needs outflow to open, and since it will not allow any backflow during the next flood tide, there will not be any water available upstream to flow out during the following ebb tide. This is what I call tide gate entropy death. In January 2009, I disconnected the hydraulic cylinder from the GH850 and I installed my VBFG control mechanism. The tide gate with the VBFG mechanism has been open during the ebb tides and has closed on every flood tide for the past three and a half years, with no failures, and it has not required any maintenance. On July 18, 2012, I did the first regular maintenance of the control mechanism. I removed the control mechanism, I replaced a short length of galvanized wire rope with stainless steel wire rope, I lubricated a sheave, and I inspected the internal parts, including what I refer to as the tension regulator. The tension regulator looked as good as new. Alright, it's 2.55, less than an hour since I started, I've got everything back together, the maintenance is done, and in that less than an hour I still had to deal with the hornet's nest in this thing. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, I realized that the top hinge flap gate to the north of my VBFG at Edison Slough is the very flap gate that Golden Harvest used for the photo of their online brochure for their GH39. Uh, this is the Golden Harvest top hinge flap gate at Edison Slough. It's buried a little better than halfway up in mud, and it's been this way for a couple of years. More nice work. In 2006, the Skagit County Public Works Service Water Management Department executed the Edison Slough SRT replacement project. 
so I spent $191,000. Up until I retrofitted the Golden Harvest GH850 with my VBFG mechanism in January of 2009, the GH850 just sat there, stuck shut. Since I retrofitted it over three years ago, this tight has been opening and closing every day without a single failure. As a result, the modest amount of tidal flushing occurs. Fish can get past the tie gate to access the habitat upstream, and the salt tarp vegetation upstream of the tie gate is spectacular. I fixed the GH 850 for $7,500. $191,000 versus 7500 In three and a half years, the operation and maintenance required for the VBFG mechanism totaled less than an hour. That reflects great engineering. For contrast, Golden Harvest GH39, to the north, remains stuck in the mud, completely useless. How did this happen? The short answer is poor engineering. The long answer requires 47 pages. If you're interested in the long answer, go to www.issue.com, enter Jewel Tide Gates, and read the Fisher Slough Tide Gate debacle. Back to the short answer. This is a photograph from a Corps of Engineers publication showing Ed and me and the project manager, Forrest, Forrest Brooks. Ed is a hydrologist. He is not a design engineer. If you hire a hydrologist to do engineering design, and his initials are ETZ, and he works for a company whose initials are NHC, and if he doesn't know how to use one of these, it is inevitable that you will end up with a poorly engineered project, like the Tidegate at Port Stanley, Tide Lagoon, and the GH850 installed at Edison Slough. It is no coincidence that both of these projects happened in 2006. I was not involved with either of these Tidegate projects during the design or the construction phases. $191,000 is a lot of money, but Tom Slocum's Port Stanley Tidegate project cost $275,000. In 2008, I retrofitted the Port Sanity Tide Gate with my VBFG mechanism for a whopping $469.58. And it worked great for a few years. This is a photo I took of the failed Port Sanity Tide Gate after it was removed from the vault on Lopez Island. Poor choices result in poor performance. The combined cost of the 2006 Port Sanity Project and the 2006 Edison Slough SRT replacement project was nearly a half million dollars. Ouch. The following graphs put these costs into perspective. The 7500 that I charged Skagit County to salvage a working tie gate from their 191000 Edison Slough SRT replacement misadventure is literally chump change. A half million dollars may sound like a lot of money, but the $7.7 .7 million Fisher Slough buckle really takes the cake. That's what I'm talking about. At least the Edison Sioux Tiger project ended with success. It's a beautiful thing.